Good morning. Everybody warm enough? Hard to believe out walking around this morning in the nippy, chilly, foggy, dank that we're supposed to have like 84 degrees and bright sunshine by the end of the week. Somebody needs to make up their mind. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. What an awesome day to be alive and what an awesome day to serve God. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you. It is you that is at work in us, according to the scripture, both the will and the work of your good pleasure. Father, as we come together in your very presence this morning, our heart's desire is to see your will done, to see your kingdom come in each and every one of us and in this world. And Father, we, we come before you to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray that you would be satisfied with our songs as we set the table before you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Casting my cares aside, I'm leaving my past behind. I'm setting my heart and mind on you, Jesus. Reaching my hand to yours, believing there's so much more, knowing that all you have in store for me is good, is good. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad. my doubts behind I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you Jesus oh Jesus reaching my hand to yours believing there's so much more knowing that all you have in store for me is good it's good today is a day you have Rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today is the day. Lord, wherever 
overwhelmed by your glory, Lord. I see the work of your hands, galaxies spin in a heavenly dance, oh God, all that you
Lord, there's power in your name, Lord. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. So 
Just shake them off. Just shake off those chains, those things that are binding you. Shake them off. Shake them off. Shake them off.
No, my love is the purpose and the freedom that needs to penetrate into the heart of many. Know that I am raising up an army, strong and powerful, for those things that are about to come. You will be my people. Just let that love penetrate, penetrate into your hearts.
We declare, Lord, this morning that you are great and mighty. But Lord, you are as tender as you are powerful toward those who love you and call upon your beautiful name. Be exalted, Lord of heaven and earth. Lord Jesus, we give you all the praise and everybody said, Amen. Well, turn to your neighbor and say, good to see you this morning. You may be seated. This is Missions Offering Sunday. So we'll be taking two offerings. The first one for the regular needs of the church and the second one for our missions outreach. And there's a lot going on around here. In the next week, uh, sometime within the next 10 days, you'll see our parking lot start to get treated. And, uh, you know, that's just something I really look forward to, writing that big check every, or getting that, you know, every couple of years or three years. But how many of you know a stitch in time? If we'll do this now, it'll extend the life of it. And... Uh, I love the smell of asphalt in the morning. Yeah. Actually, there is one smell like that that I do like, and that is that I could, you know, I, sometimes I feel like when I'm going into Costco, I just need to go into the tire center and just go. I love the smell of new tires. It's pretty cool. But, <laughs> that's real spiritual. Uh, in Mark chapter 10, it says in verse 17, and as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him, meaning Jesus, and knelt before him and began asking him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now that's a challenge right there because Jesus was asking him, how serious are you going to take, or seriously, are you going to take the words that I'm about to speak to? You've asked me a question. How many of you know sometimes we better not ask God a question if we don't want to deal with the answer? And he says, why do you call me good? This is verse 18. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. 
You know the commandments. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Notice that he brought that in there. What's that about? That's about general attitude toward authority in addition to the family. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Now, in uh, I, maybe it's Matthew's gospel, either that or it's Luke's, recording this same incident, he goes on to say, what am I still lacking? He sensed something was missing. He sensed that even though he had been, you know, checking all the boxes, so to speak, that there was something missing. There was something that he just somehow wasn't quite connecting. And looking at him, verse 21, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. You know, if we're going to truly follow Jesus, we're really going to be disciples. It'll cost us everything. Not that it means that Jesus will ever speak to you to sell everything you have and give to the poor. I think in this particular case, and I mean, uh, there will be times when he'll have us give sacrificially. There will be times when he speaks to you to do something that either you don't necessarily, you know, financially, that you don't either necessarily want to do or you don't think you can do. And yet he does speak to that. Why? Because it really boils down to trust. In the days to come, how many of you are noticing that our government, the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve, and everything attached to it, they are scrambling to try to deal with the fallout of some pretty bad decisions. And they don't know what to do. And they're in the in and you know, you look at it and you go, and many, many people who have a lot more knowledge about economics than I uh, have been saying that the things that they're doing may be easing the pain in the short term, but it's gonna create a bigger problem down the, down the line. Well, you know, here's the thing. The Lord can show you how to navigate that. And He is our source. He is our source. He is our so Remember when they were getting on the, you know, that after he had fed, you know, 4,000 and he had already fed 5,000 and they're on the boat and he says, beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they're looking at each other goes and thinking, we didn't bring any bread. We didn't bring any food. Who brought the sandwiches? Nobody brought sandwiches for the trip. And the Lord said, looked at him and goes, what? He said, I wasn't, I wasn't talking about that, but just suppose for a minute I was. Do you not remember the five loaves and the two fish and, and, the, and, the, and the 5,000 and the, the, the four loaves, the seven fish, whatever, and the, and the 4,000? You know, how many, how many baskets did you pick up? A lot. Think, guys. Do you think that provision for us is a problem, really. Yet we have a tendency to look and, you know, and this, and it says Jesus, and it said, but at these words, verse 22, his face fell, talking about the rich young ruler, his face fell, his countenance fell, and he went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. Jesus says over in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, where your treasure is, will, there will your heart be also. And if God hasn't, you know, I remember the deacon at the very first, one of the deacons at the very first church I ever pastored saying that he said, you know, some of the people, and he was the keeper of the books. And he said, you know, some of our people are really good people, but when they got baptized, they made sure their wallet didn't go under the water. And I didn't ask him for names. I didn't want to know. And, you know, in the days to come, we're going to have to trust God for everything. How many of you have already come? How many of you realize we've already come to the place where we've got to trust God for physical health and strength, you know, to keep us safe? And he goes on to say, you know, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God and the disciples 
were gobsmacked. And he said, it's easier for the camel to go through an eye of the needle. But one of the things, one of the, things the Western text adds that is not in the, uh, uh, the earlier text is that he says how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. I want to caution this all because it says very clearly, and we'll look at that in First Peter, or, uh, Second Timothy, chapter three, that in the last days men will become, and if you read that as an ingredient list, the very first thing it says is, lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of money, and money. You know what? How many of you remember this? That how many of you ever heard money can't buy happiness? It can't. It can rent a good time but that will pass. And what, if you want to know what's important to somebody, see what they're doing with their money. Where, where am I? Where is my heart toward God? Where is my treasure? Amen. And we're going, we're going through. Everybody say amen. Hallelujah. Come on, sweetie. Amen. Are you ready to give? Amen. We're going to have the ushers come forward. Just as pastor mentioned before, this is the first Sunday of the month of October, and so we have two offerings. Our first offering that we're going to receive is for the regular needs of the church, and our second offerings will be for our missionaries and our local outreach. Okay, so this offering will be for the regular needs of the church, so for everyone in the sanctuary. If you're writing a check, you can make it payable to Independence Christian Center or ICC will suffice. If you're giving cash and you would like tax deductible credit, all you need to do is raise your hand and we'll get you a seed below. And just a reminder, if you can completely fill all the information on that envelope, it would be greatly appreciated. We do have other avenues in giving. One way is you can send a check via mail to our address that you see on the screen. And also, or also, or you can utilize your bank's online bill pay or you could bring it to the church in person. Another way you can give is by giving online. So all you have to do is you go to our website, which is www.iccfamily.org, and under the banner of our website, there'll be a tab, Give Online. Click that tab, and then you'll be taken to our Easy Tithe app. Just follow the directions. You can give via credit card, debit card, or by electronic check. Another way you can give is by texting. All you have to do is text GIVE, G-I-V-E, and that will be, of course, on your cell phone at the number that you see on the screen. And you'll have a link that will be sent to your phone via text, so you just hit that web link, and you'll be sent to the Easy Tie app. And it is easy. Amen. Thank you for everyone that it gives. The Lord sees your giving. Amen. Okay, well, be... Before we receive this offering, I have one announcement, and that is this coming Tuesday. This coming Tuesday, October 6th, will be the Just for Men meeting. And this meeting is Just for Men, so you'll meet right here at the church. And that is the announcement. So my question is for this first offering, does anyone need a seed envelope? If you do, raise your hand and we'll get you one. <clears throat> we'll get your offering in your hand. We're believing God. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you are our source. Not the government, not the economy. Those things are important, Lord. I'm not putting them down. But Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the final analysis, you are the good shepherd who causes us to lie down in green pastures. You are the good shepherd who causes us to, to lie down by uh, living waters, still waters, waters of peace, literally. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you the glory. We worship you with our giving. We're not doing this as duty. We are doing this, Father, out of adoration to you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen.
Amen. We're going to have the ushers come forward again, and we're going to give again. Amen. And this will be for our missionaries and our local outreach that we support on a monthly basis. Okay. Just as before, if you're writing a check, just you can make it payable to Independence Christian Center or ICC. Uh, if you're giving cash, if you need a seed envelope, raise your hand. We'll get you a seed envelope. And then there are other avenues in giving. You can send a check via mail. You'll see the address on your screen, banks online bill pay. You can bring it by the church. You can give online, which you see the website on the screen. Or you can text, text give on your cell phone, and you see the number on your screen. And when you do it online or texting, there'll be an area with a designation. All you have to do is click missions for that. Okay, one more announcement before we receive our second offering. That is Tuesday, October 13th will be our women's meeting, which is the gift. Gals and Fellowship together will be meeting. Put that on your schedule, ladies. We'll have a great time. And for any more information regarding these meetings, all you have to do is check the, our bulletin board or our website calendar or the department head. Okay, does anyone need a seed envelope for this offering? If you do, raise your hand. So the men's meeting, we have meat. It's a meat thing. Okay. Women's meeting, is that like salad and chocolate? What, and we have meat too. You have meat too? We have a great huh? right All right. Great. Balance. <laughs> All right. Gives her offering. Your We're believing God. Father, it is a privilege to stand with you and to preach the gospel all over the world. Father, to minister to those who are, let, who are hungry, but even in our own area here. Father, your kingdom come. Your will be done. As we stand with you, and labor and reach out to others to bring them the gospel, to bring them good things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you as you get. Well, let's all stand as we present our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Glory. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, we're taking it. We are taking advantage. And Lord, in Jesus' name, we stand. We are those that stay with the stuff get the same as those that go. David said that. That's for our missions offering. And Lord, we... Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in your house. Because Lord, we know that there are things you are preparing for your people that are absolutely beyond wonderful. 
And Lord, we don't want to miss any of that. We don't want to leave anything on the table. That everything you have for us, that Lord, we will walk in it and walk in your magnificent, not just your provision, but your anointing. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Praise God. Open your Bibles to John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. We're also going to be looking at some things over in 1 John chapter 1. If you'd like to turn there, you may. Um, yesterday, uh, no, day before yesterday, this is grass planting season, and I've decided to get really serious about some bare spots in my lawn. And, uh, you know, that it's just, you know, the, the neighbors were tired of looking at it a long time before I was, I'm sure. So I went out here to the grass pad to buy some, some grass seed. And, and um, if you've been over there, you know that particularly this time of year, because they have so many people coming through there, it becomes a real machine. I mean, they just, you know, blow people through there, blow people through there. And, and, uh, but when I pulled up on, on Friday, there was very few people there. It's kind of a slow time. And so you, what you do is you park, you go in, you buy your, your, your seed and everything. And if you're buying a, a, a large amount, you, get your, you drive down to the, what would be the east end of their lot where they've got a gravel area there. And you turn around and come back and they, they will throw, you know, they'll put your, load you up. And so I went in and I told the young lady, I said, I, you know, I want to buy a 50 pound bag of uh, grass seed. And she said, well, what kind would you like? And I said, give me the macho mix. That's 95% fescue, 5% rye. So I paid for it. And as I'm walking out the door, she gets on the radio because all the, the employees carry radios on them. And apparently they've all got them cranked up. And apparently they were all standing in the immediate area because it sounds like she sounded like she put it on like a PA system. And what I heard as I'm walking out the door is, 50 pounds of macho mix walking out, or no, macho, 50 pounds of macho walking out the door. 50 pounds of macho walking out the door. So I laughed all the way to the forerunner. I get in it, I drive down to the gravel area, turn around and come up, and when I put the, the tailgate up, the guy grabs, I hand him the thing, and he goes, oh, okay, like that, and I said, by the way, I weigh more than 50 pounds. You know, that's one of those things that you can't make this stuff up. Um, Isaiah chapter, well, let me, let me back up and read 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, which we're kind of using as a golden text for our series on speaking the truth in love. Peter says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So that... So in other words, there's a reason. So that you may proclaim, announce, publish abroad, broadcast, the excellencies, literally the virtue, the character, of him who has called you out of what? Darkness. Into his marvelous, not just light, but his marvelous what? Light. For you once were not a people, but now you're the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Isaiah chapter 60, in the theme of darkness and light. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 says this Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of Yahweh, the glory of the Lord, has risen upon you. For behold, verse 2, darkness will cover the earth. Notice that's future tense there. Darkness will cover the earth. Almost all biblical theologians agree this is a, an eschatological, an end time passage. Darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness, gross darkness, I believe the King James says, the peoples. But Yahweh, the Lord, will rise upon you and His glory will appear upon you. Now, I... I don't want to make anybody mad. I'm not trying to irritate anyone. I'm not trying to inflame any passions or anything of that nature. But today, we talked last week, uh, we, we got 
down and dirty about truth, faith, and politics. And today I want to talk about truth in the ballot box. Truth in the ballot box. We have a responsibility. Everybody know that. Amen. All right. You know, darkness is ignorance of God's truth. Ignorance of God. Deep darkness goes beyond ignorance to being a rebellion against God and against truth. When you read that, remember that the entire Old Testament has one worldview, and that is that there is a cosmic war raging between the God of heaven is in Yahweh and his son, Jesus Christ, who's Yahweh in the flesh and the Holy Spirit, and the fallen spirits who rebelled against him and have really torn things up, tempted Adam, caught it, you know, caused the, the fall of humanity and all that kind of, you know, you know, we don't want to go on into all that. But it is a cosmic war. And it is a war against God and against his people. God, according to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, is light. He is more than light. He is marvelous light. He is pure light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. And this is the message we have heard from him and announce. That word announce is a cognate of the word Peter used for proclaim over back at, that we just read in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. And what we have, uh, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Amen. Not even a smidgen, all right? His word, his creation, his deeds, his direction, it all comes out of light. That's why when we see verse 2 of Isaiah 60, for behold, the darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But Yahweh, the Lord, will rise upon you. That means light will rise upon you. Remember, glory is something that shines. It is, it is a, and when you see the Elohim in the Old Testament, the holy ones, you see beings whose faces are like lightning and that their voices are like thunder and the sound of many waters. And sometimes that is the angel of the Lord who's Yahweh number two, Yahweh, pre, you know, before visible Yahweh, before he became flesh, the word who became flesh. But other times it is other angelic spirits. And the one thing when you read through the scripture, you become, you become aware of very quickly is that the angelic spirits glow. They shine. Why? Because the glory that Yahweh built into them, the glory that God built into them, even the devil himself is able to manifest himself as, as an angel of light because it is the nature in which God created him. Of course, he twists that. More of that later. This is the message that we have heard, we have heard from him and announced to you all that God is light. And in him there is no darkness. Yet we see the deep darkness, do we not? Amen. Coming upon the world. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6. Paul says to the saints at Thessalonica, Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything be written to you. Oh, how I would love to have been in Thessalonica and sat at Paul's feet and hear him talk about those things. So I'm not trying to piece together what he means when he writes to them, knowing that they knew what he had already said. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And while they're saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come. Why would they cry out peace and safety? Because there had been war and destruction. And then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief for you are all sons of light. Everybody say, I'm a son of the light. And that includes you ladies. Because son means offspring. You know, that, that's all. Sons of day. We are not of night, nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do. Intentional ignorance. 
But let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep, do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. So what we see there, people spiritually asleep, people doing sinful, rebellious things. But he's saying believers are to be sons. We are sons of the light and we are to walk in the light. What is he saying? Everybody wake up. Amen. The darkness, now, when we talk about darkness, in the scripture, darkness is very clearly characterized for us. Let me give you some scriptures. I mean, I'm, I realize I'm kind of throwing a lot at you today, but, you know, we want, we want to know, don't we? Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Everybody say the devil. That's who it is. That's who the prince of the power is. He's the Nachash, the, the serpent, Lucifer. Of the spirit, the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. We are sons of light. If you're not a son of light, the light, you are a son of disobedience. Are, are you with me here? Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Sons of disobedience versus sons of light. Titus 3.3. 3. Titus 3.3. 3. For we also were once foolish ourselves. Look at this. Disobedient deceived. I do not have time to talk about that today, but we will come back to the deception that is swirling in our world. And it is. And what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21, and Mark chapter 13, right? Matthew, actually I should have put Mark in the middle if I want to get it in correct synoptical order. He said, see to it that you are not misled. He put responsibility for not being misled squarely on our shoulders. The way we are not misled is to know the truth, to measure everything by the truth. But let's keep reading here in Titus 3.3. 3. For we were once, or we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts, you know, the word epithumia, translated lust, simply means desire. In the places where it is a good desire, the, generally the uh, New Testament translators will translate it desire. And then where it's negative, they translate it lust because lust has a negative nuance to it. But you could just say various enslaved to desires where the desires have control of us and the desires drive us rather than knowledge and, the, and, and love. And pleasures, look at this, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. If you want to know what darkness looks like, there it is. Insla disobedient, deceived, because the more we listen to lies, the less we are able to. The, 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 it diminishes our ability to discern truth. A lot of people believe things that are unbiblical, not because they really know those things to be true, but because it's one of these things where we put our, ear, our hands over our ears and go, la, 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 because we do not want to hear that. We don't want that to be true. Everybody still love me? We're going someplace good with this, but we gotta get, we gotta wade through the, you know, this first. First John chapter 3 and verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. I did not write that. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Hatred will kill. Hatred will murder. Are we seeing hatred today? Absolutely. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. This is, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times. Now, you've heard me say this. 
times without number. The word translated difficult, that's an under translation. The word translated difficult is the word chalapoi, which means savage. It means violent. It means dangerous, perilous, hard to take. Really, really rugged, tough times. And dangerous times will come. For men will be lovers of self. Now, I often like to say this, that he's about to give us a litany of things that are descriptions of life in the darkness here. And look at it as the ingredient label on the back of something you're purchasing at the, at the grocery store. And you know that it's listed in the order of the most, you know, what it, uh, is the most plentiful to the least, uh, you know. And so when you, and it says ingredients, if it says sugar, you know the sugar's the biggest component of whatever's in there, all right? So lovers of self, and then out of that grows lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, uh, uh, revilers. In other words, <laughs> reviling and, and, and criticizing and denigrating. Uh, disobedient to parents, rejecting all authority. Ungrateful. What have you done for me lately? Unholy. In other words, there's no, there's no care for, there's, there's no concern about righteousness and uprightness and, and purity. Unloving. Irreconcilable. In other words, you can reach out and try to make peace and there is no peace, there is no compromise. It's my way or the highway. Malicious gossips. With no, without self-control. Brutal. Haters of good. Treacherous means there's absolutely, you can't believe anything they say, there, there's no faithfulness in them at all. Reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The main characteristic of everything I just read to you is the consuming love of self. If you don't give me what I want, I hate you. I don't have any use for you at all. And what's good, you know, what's good for me and convenient for me, what I want, that is what should rule everybody, right? Don't tell me no, don't dispute me, and don't make me wait. How many of you have ever had that don't make me wait thing come over you when you are sitting at the drive-thru of the slowest Taco Bell? I've even said it out of my mouth. I'm not here for the whole cuisine. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm here for speed. Or you get behind somebody. It just happened to me the other day. I got behind. You're driving down the road. 40, 45 mile an hour speed limit, which means you're doing, you know, somebody says, do you do the speed limit? Yes, and more. <laughs> I, go, I go over and above. And then somebody pulls out of the quick trip out here on, you know, that little blue. And somebody, you know, whether I can think you jerk or you have no death perception, Father, heal them. <laughs> and then once they've gotten in front of me and I have to slow down to keep from going and I've got traffic on my right, I can't, or I mean my left, and I can't get around them. And this little blue Subaru is going 15 miles an hour under the speed limit. Blood pressure. Rising. Oh, Father. Now that's just a little illustration of what don't make me wait can, can produce. How many of you always look for the shortest line at checkout? I'm not saying it's spiritual to look for the longest one. Amen. You know, hallelujah. Envy. Jealousy. And a word we've come to hear quite a bit lately. An entitlement mentality. The world owes this to me. Jesus warned us in Luke 21, one of those three passages I cited a few minutes ago as being his description of the last days. Luke 21, 9 and 10, he says, when you hear of wars and disturbances, we talked about this before, 
War is just exactly what it sounds like. The word disturbances actually means violent political strife and upheaval. Just exactly what we're seeing today. And it's not just in the U.S. You know, you see that a lot because of our mainstream media. Uh, but the fact is it's happening all over the world. All of humanity is. That's when Jesus talked about how that, that humanity would begin, the wind and the waves, we would say boiling. It's, it's, it's seething with, all, with everything that's happening. And the governments are making major mistakes and they don't know what to do. And it says, when you hear of wars, and that's the nature of it, is war and disturbances, don't be terrified. Everybody say amen. amen. Don't be terrified for these things have to take place first. But that, the end doesn't follow immediately. And he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation. That is ethnos will rise against ethnos. That is people group will rise up against people group. That could be races, that could be tribes, that could be special interest groups. It could be, it doesn't, when it says kingdom against kingdom, those are countries. And we're seeing that. The Albanians and the, uh, or I mean the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis are fighting even now. China and India are getting into it. In the Middle East, there's all kinds of stuff there going on. And it's, 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 like, it's a fight fest. You know, the, the, the world is, 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 is seeding. And he says, when you see these things, don't be terrified. Nation, you know, groups will rise up against each other. Countries will rise up against each other. And these things are going to happen. There's going to be war. There's going to be strife, killing and pillaging and looting. Just exactly like that's just exactly as Paul would go on to detail. All right. Well, let's talk about, let's flip this over and talk about truth for just a minute. Everybody ready for that? In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, John the Apostle pens these, these words. In the beginning was who? The Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In other words, the Creator Himself became flesh. Amen. Now, how many of you know that the Creator knows how something works? You know, when you, you know, uh, I, what is it? I, I, uh, back in the day, one of my favorite uh, TV shows was Home Improvement. How many of you remember that show? Tim the Tool Man Taylor. Arr, 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 you know, and I had a t-shirt that said, that had the Home Improvement logo on it, and it said, real men don't need instructions. <laughs> I have discovered in putting together multiple barbecue grills in my life that that is far from the truth. And there is nothing more maddening than getting all the way to step nine of a 10 or 11 step process only to realize that you weren't paying attention to step three and you've got to undo half of what you've done or more, in other words, to go back and to fix that part or the whole thing won't work. Sure. And God knows how the whole thing works. And that's why he tells us, walk this way. Why? This is what will work. This is the way it will, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll do. It'll, get, it'll go for you. I remember hearing one guy, fellow pilot, talking about how he used to fly in an airplane. They used to just absolutely freeze him out. And you know what? Even in the summertime, when you get up much over eight, 9,000 feet, it gets cold up there. And... You know, and just and by the time he would land wherever he was on it, he's just turned into a popsicle. And finally, after however many hours of struggling with this, he reached down and grabbed the POH, the pilot's operating handbook. Every airplane has one. When all else fails, read the instructions. And he got it out and he looked at it. He go, what's the deal? Like this. And it said, do this. Do that. And then do this. And it got warm. All this time, he had been needlessly suffering simply because he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do to make it warm. Saints, when God tells us, walk this way, he says, it's like he said to Israel, I lay before you the blessing and the curse. 
De you know, I, life and death. And then he even, you know, choose. And then he gives them a hint. Choose life. You'll like it better. But today we're choosing death. We're a culture. There are so many who want a culture of death. He is the creator of everything. Go back to John chapter 1. Let's keep reading. And um, let's see. Verse 4. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Everybody say amen. That's good. And the light shines in the darkness. And I'm going to give you a better rendering of this. The darkness could not overcome it. Life, not death, life. Life and light. Life, light and life. And in verse 14 of that same first chapter of John, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory. I love the word dwelt because it's actually, actually and the King James says tabernacled. It's, the word literally is tented. He tented, skinao, he tented among us. And we saw his glory, that's light, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. He said, how, how could John say that? John was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he saw Jesus' face shine. He saw his garments change as his inner nature came out. One of, one of my professors in seminary used to say that, that they're on the Mount of Transfiguration, probably the only time in his entire life, Jesus exhaled and relaxed. The rest of the time, he's holding his breath, holding his divinity, his magnificence in to walk it out as a man. And there for just a couple of minutes, and they were absolutely amazed. And as he is, so shall we be. We are beings of light. Everybody say, we're sons of the light. Amen. All right, keep, keep reading. And we saw his glory, glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and what? Truth. Full of grace and truth. Um, what is grace? Grace is empowerment. It's not just forgiveness. It is the anointing of God that enables us to walk with God and, and, and truth. All right. Furthermore, light and love are synonymous in God. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Well, I want to come back to 1 John, or John 14, 6 first before we get any further. And that is, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We must not back off that. We must not compromise. There are people that, that, will, that will irritate them. There are people that will see that as narrow-minded. Well, okay it is. Narrow is the way. Broad is the path to destruction. You can do anything or do nothing and go to hell, but you don't, there's only one thing you can do and go to heaven. And in John, 1 John rather, 4, 7, and 8, coming back to light and love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love God does not, or does not love, does not know God, for God is love. So we have on the one hand that God is light, and then John tells us that God is love. Love is the very stuff of God. And love himself came to this earth to redeem us. Love himself came and walked this earth and was rejected. He came to his own and his own didn't receive him, it says right there. And we know that God is love because it says in John 3, 16, For God so what the world? Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Everyone, every single human being has value. Every single life is precious. Every single life has meaning. The character of darkness is hatred, self-seeking, arrogance, and violence. The character of darkness is mind over matter. I don't mind and you don't matter. Acts chapter, you know, uh, when, when love is in, is in charge, there is self-sacrifice. 
There is self-effacing. There is help. There is mercy. There is grace toward other people rather than darkness. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, verses 33, if you are on the same Bible reading plan I am, you read it this morning because we're in Acts chapter 4. It's the fourth day of the month, Acts chapter 4. And it says, And the grit with great power... The apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all because for there were, was not a needy person among them for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. God isn't calling us to be communists. This was something that was set, you know, but this was something that was in happening because so many people after the day of Pentecost had, were in Jerusalem visiting and they decided to stay because of the awesome things that were happening in this new thing called the way. And they were not, and remember it goes on in Acts chapter 5, the very next chapter, and it talks about how that, you know, some people were being over, oh, well, maybe it's the next one, or being overlooked in the ministration of food, you know, that is in Acts 6, I believe. And, and how that they named uh, deacons because they said it's not right for us to uh, depart from studying the prayer of the Word of God and to serve tables because they had lots of widows. They had lots of people that had attached themselves and the church was taking care of those individuals. And it took a while for things to stabilize because of all the people who were in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 and stayed because of what God was doing. I'm telling you, when God's moving powerfully, people don't want to go home. When God's doing something, it, amen. For darkness, however, life is cheap. For the light, life is precious. If we want to walk in truth, if we want to walk in the light, if we want to walk in love, in obedience to the scriptures, in, that means in obedience to the, the word, the word became flesh and explained it all to us. I want you to think about this for just a minute. Coming back to light. Humanity was created in the image of God. I'm going to give you some truth here. I want you to hang on to this. Humanity was created in the image of God. In Matthew chapter 19 and verses 4 and 5, uh, Jesus confirms Moses. And Jesus answered them, answered them and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? What? Male and female. Okay, so God created two genders. Not 50, not 60, not three. Two genders. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. When the two become one flesh, that's not just getting married. It is, the, it is part of the act of procreation. God is a creator. He is the creator. We are pro-creators. God gives us the privilege of being his agents in the creation of new imagers. Little imagers. I was, we were out at the, one of these pumpkin patch things the other day and I was walking. There was a guy with a big gray full beard, looked like a biker guy, and he was standing there holding in his arms a baby that couldn't be more than probably, I don't know, maybe you know, two months old, top, little bitty tiny baby. And here's this big burly, beard, gray beard, you know, biker looking guy, hold this teeny little baby. You know, and you could, I, you know, it's, it had to be his grandchild, you know, or, or like, because he's just, you know, and that baby's just like that. And as I walked past him, I said, I was never that small. <laughs> when a child is conceived in the womb, that is an imager. That child is made in the image of God and has a destiny in God. There are no unplanned pregnancies in God. Every, how, many of you, how many of you know that God's never surprised when a woman gets pregnant? Neither should she be, but moving along. The, 
And the creation, the pro, we procreate, but he creates. That is an imager. He and only he has the authority of life and death over an imager. I don't care whether that imager is 80 years old, 50 years old, 40 years old, or 15 seconds after conception. Are you with me here? That is truth. That is the truth. God gave us that privilege. And every imager that is created is related to every other imager that has ever been created. Acts chapter 17, verse 26a, it says in uh, the King James Version, because it comes from the Western text, which I like better, and that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. We are all from one blood. I don't care what color your skin is, what your culture is, any of that stuff, what your mother language is, we all came from one person, all came from one blood. We are, you know, somebody said, well, we're all brothers and sisters. Well, we might not be brothers and sisters, but we are cousins. We are family. I don't care. And there is no room for racism in, in love. There is no room for anything of any, any kind of prejudicial or denigrating uh, thing toward other, per, other individuals because of their culture, because of their origin, because of their race, for any other reason. Any reason at all. There is no, I like that. Why? Because we all stand, we, what was the song we used to sing when I was a kid? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Every last one of us. But see, we go, Jesus loves the little children. All the children. You know, but Jesus loves the little children that are 65 years old. Jesus loves the little children that are 55, 45, 35, 25. You name it. Jesus loves all of them. Why? Because they're His creation. Now, I've, I've finished my introduction. Gross darkness is here. Gross darkness is here with the violence and the hatred that we saw that it would bring, which is ever more reason for us as sons of light to shine even more brightly. Galatians 5, 6 says, faith works by love. And 1 Corinthians 13, 8a tells us that Faith or that love never fails. When you go through Romans 1, we're not going to do that today. We don't have the time. But when you go through Romans chapter 1, he lays out the details of lawlessness for us. Lawlessness goes beyond disobedience. Lawlessness is a rebellion, not just against things, but against God himself and against his design. I don't have to. You know, I was born with a, with, a, with a gender assignment. I was. As are 99.999% of the, you know, I, and we don't, have to, we don't have to wonder what that assignment is. And I can rebel against God's authority. And I can rebel uh, against His assignment for me. But it will not go well for me. Are you with me? Further, and here's something that's even more important, you get a nation that is overwhelmed and overrun by that, it will be judged. Even if you just look at it and say, well, it's just the natural uh, blowback of sin. Well, okay, fine. But either way you look at it, I mean, when, when God said to Abraham, the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete, but the day came when it was, and he says, the land vomiteth out its inhabitants. Even, and I know there are people who will say, this is a knuckle-dragging, troglodyte, unbelievably unscientific. Let me tell you something, I'm tired of science. Science can't make up its mind. One scientist says this, another one scientist says that, blah, 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 and politicians whip out and they claim science as their, you know, as their, as, as their, uh, their authority for truth and all this, and it's like, really? And another word that I'm concerned about is the word expert. 
it has been used just way too much. What was it? I heard somebody say a long time ago, what is an expert? He's a little spurred away from home. <laughs> we rebel against God's authority. We rebel, we usurp him when we terminate imagers because they're inconvenient. It's the wrong time or they're the wrong gender. Am I talking about abortion? Yes. We rebel against, you know, and now we have judges and politicians with unrighteous motives and unrighteous ethics and an ungodly worldview. We have it in our education system. Did you see the other day there was a, they did a survey? 60% of college students are, have opinions, but they're afraid to express them for the fear of the blowback they will receive from other people, other students and the, and the faculty. These things should not be so. Not in a land that was founded upon free speech. Are you with me? All right. We have politicians who, who f think nothing of taking anything as a quote-unquote emergency and usurping and doing away with our constitutional rights. And if we do not stand up and do something about this, the next time there will be a next time and another next time and another next time. I promise you. Why do I say that? Because I recognize, I'm watching what's going on in California, and that's an assault, on, and in Nevada for that matter, and that's an assault on the church. That is an assault on the church. One of the things that just recently happened, and it's been happening in Michigan, a judge, the Supreme Court in Michigan, said that the governor was out of line putting all these restrictions on people. And you can't do that. Thank God for some people who know the Constitution. And our president, we pray for our president, has nominated someone who is a constructionist, a strict constitutionalist, and people are afraid, oh my gosh, they're going to overturn, over, oh, oops, overturn Roe v. Wade. Well, it's about time. Why are we afraid of that? Yeah, that's right. We're not, they are. Wickedness is currently called righteousness and righteousness is called wickedness. Just exactly as Isaiah said what happened. Righteousness is called wrong and wrong is called righteousness. We'll get to, when we get to repentance, we're going to talk about that out of uh, you know, how that we have a job to declare that and that the church has abdicated its responsibility. We don't want to use the word repent. We don't want to use that word. It scares people off. We live in a country, now, I'll, I'll Zip it up here. <laughs> Please zip it, Pastor. We do not live in ancient Rome. We do not live in ancient Greece. Although ancient Greece, Athens in particular, was a democracy. We, live in a rep we do not live in a direct democracy. We live in a representative democracy where we vote for um, representatives and those representatives, whether they are congressmen or senators, or the president go and represent us. We have a franchise, meaning we have a vote. We have a say-so at the ballot box. When we go to the ballot box, are we gonna vote righteousness? Are we gonna vote truth? Or are we going to vote political or economic expediency? If we fail to vote for truth, and if we fail to vote, no vote is a no vote. Yeah, but you know, how many of you remember the, the, the presidential election four years ago? I had to stand in line an hour and a half just to get in there. And, and, and the enemy will come to you and say, well, your vote doesn't really matter. I mean, what's one vote? It's your vote. It's the vote God gave you. And so what, what better way to stand up and take a role? We are in a nation that functions by the consent of the governed. And I want you to know that there's a lot of things going on right now to which I do not give my consent. And we need judges. We need legislators. We need people who will stand up for righteousness. 
and stop this woke foolishness from overrunning our country and taking us down the drain. Amen. Our country is... Now, pastor's on a rant. Yes. <laughs> Remember how Bonnie Fife used to get his eyes real big? <laughs> we stand at a crossroads as a nation. Uh, let me give you one more scripture. I think I've got one more here. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. I was talking to Jean the other day and she was telling me that 25 million Christians did not vote in the last presidential election. That's huge. I'm glad I don't have to answer for that. I voted several times. <laughs> no, I'm on the side that only believes in one, per one, one to a customer. Amen. If I can, what an awesome opportunity on the consent of the governed, of the people, by the people, and for the people, for this nation to stand up and say, that it's wrong for churches to be told they cannot meet while people who are burning things down are not held accountable. Are you with me? It is, and believe me, you can go out to BLM's website, read their manifesto. The putting all churches out of business and taking their property is specifically mentioned in there as one of their goals. And a complete rewrite, a constitutional convention and a complete rewrite of the structure of our nation and our government. It is Marxism to the core. It is not about rights, it's about another, it's about something else entirely. I am not a racist, and I just said a few minutes ago, there is no room for racism in Christianity. There is no room for racism in faith, period, over, out. We reject that wherever we would see it. But that said, neither am I for a Marxist-Leninist society. Amen. Neither am I for Antifa, anarchy, being in, being in charge. And when people allow, when elected officials allow those people to run amok, that tells me where their heart is. As people's livelihoods are being destroyed, as people's very lives, everything, their businesses, everything for which they work, and a lot of these people don't have insurance. Well, and that's not just that. When they decree everything's going to shut down and only certain businesses are, are considered essential, well, what about all the people that, that they weren't considered essential? And once again, all of the things we were promised and all the statistics we were given by science turned out to be hokum. We'll talk about speaking to power. Are you interested in that? Yes. Speaking truth to power? All right, if our musicians would come. We've, we are standing, and if you're not registered to vote, you need to get registered Amen. right away. Find out where you're supposed to vote and be there with bells on. Pomegranate to bell, pomegranate to bell. <laughs> Our nation has never in my lifetime been faced with a starker choice of path forward. And I am telling you this, I truly believe in my heart that the Lord has shown me. Remember, last October, standing right here, I looked up and saw something in the spirit that there was an acceleration of world events, an acceleration of moving, that God was speeding things up. That we were coming to that time. And I am so excited about some of the things that I am seeing about the future. And I'm doing my best to connect the dots from all the things he's shown, through me, shown me through the, through the years. But we are standing at a point where if we as a nation will choose righteousness, we will vote righteousness. And I didn't say righteously. Somebody would say, I can't stand either one. Hold your nose. The fact of the matter is, and we don't vote for people. When I was a kid, we used to be able to vote for people because there were good people on both sides. And there probably may still be, but the fact of the matter is, you've got to go by party platform because that's what they're going to vote. When the part, when a push comes to shove, you know, when the chips are down, that's what they're going to do. 
And if they're going to vote life, if they're going to vote love, if they're going to vote goodness, if they're going to vote grace, they're going to vote mercy. They're going to protect life. They're going to protect liberty. They're going to protect those things. That's one thing. But if they're not protecting it, which they are not, many, half of them, we have to acknowledge that and we have to vote for life. Vote for liberty. Even if it irritates our neighbors and there will be convulsions. You wait and see. There will be convulsions. But here's what I'm saying. If we as a nation will turn toward righteousness and vote righteousness, God will see from heaven and move toward our nation. And many of the things which look like they're about to happen that are horrible will not happen. And God will meet us in ways which will be absolutely amazing. If, however, we as a nation move toward death and oppression and murder, legalized murder, God will also answer that. And it will not be good. Make no mistake, the church will prosper either way. But we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility before God. We have a responsibility before the King. I, he has trusted me to live in a nation that, ha, that gives me a say-so. Maybe it's just a teeny little bitty sliver of a say-so, but you know what? You get into those little teeny slivers. How many of you know there's not a lot of energy in a calorie? There's not a lot of fat. There is almost no fat in a calorie, but you get enough of those calories together and things happen. Amen. We've got to stand for biblical truth. We've got to vote for biblical truth. We've got to vote for morality and for biblical character. Somebody said, neither one of the people that's running is a biblical character. No, but one of them is a friend of the church, is a friend of Israel, and a friend of righteousness, and a friend of life. How do you, you know, there is no... This, now is not the tire, time to cower or to throw up our hands in resignation. Because if we will move toward God as a nation, our God will move toward us. Then there will be another stage after that. First we'll get that done. Then there will be the convulsions. And then we will see how courageous our government is. Because there are some things that had better be changed. And if they get changed, good things will happen. If they don't, the grace period will expire. I'm just telling you, what a wonderful day to be alive and what an awesome time to glow in the dark as a believer because our God is faithful. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I've said some strong things today, but I ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, give us listening, attentive ears and help us to hear what your spirit is saying. Help us to realize, Father, we've got to be careful how we talk to other people because sometimes what we're saying is just bouncing right off of them and it's not helping them, Father. If anything, it's infuriating them. Give us wisdom in that area. But Lord, nobody's watching in that, vote, in that polling place, in that voting booth. Nobody sees. We don't have to worry about that. And Father, I pray that your goodness and mercy would open the eyes of the populace of this nation and that the choice, which could not be any starker, that, Lord, this people will remember the covenant our forefathers, our founding fathers made with you and move toward you and move toward righteousness and move toward goodness and mercy and grace and life and not vote because some way that, because, well, I get more stuff if I do this. Thank you, Father. Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's no
Christ my all in all, my joy and my salvation. And this hope those of you watching by the internet, I hope I didn't ruffle your feathers, but truth is truth. Make no mistake, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. What we are seeing in our newspapers, on television, on the internet, is the acceleration of history coming to a conclusion. God, one of the things that Jesus said to the, the disciples in Acts chapter 1, he said, it is not for you to know the how longs or the whens, the times or the epochs, which the Father has fixed by his authority. There is, it will all end the way he wants it to end, where he wants it to end, and when he wants it to end. And in that, I want to encourage you that it's not unlimited. There is an end. Today is the day of salvation. Right now, if you're not a believer in Jesus of Nazareth, I want to encourage you in the strongest possible terms. Come to him. He said, remember we, we talked about John 14. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Would you pray that with us today? Would you say, Father, come into my heart. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Father, I confess with my, my lips and I believe with my heart that Jesus Christ is your Son and that you have raised Him from the dead. 
Would you do that? Would you pass from death into life and from the dominion under the boot of the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and into the kingdom of God's beloved son? And once you do that, get in a church where the scripture is preached and where they unabashedly, unabashedly, unashamedly call the Bible the truth, the written word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. We're finishing up Ezekiel tonight, six o'clock. Encourage you to be here. Go out there and enjoy that sun's out now. Go out and enjoy that beautiful day. You are dismissed. I have decided.